everybody. So, uh, welcome to another lesson of chess and psychology. Um, for this week, we are going to look at uh, hopefully one and a half one and a half game of mine, and the other half is um, end game, and we'll continue it uh, in our next lesson, uh, which is right after this one, the intense and end game, which that should also be available on YouTube, just a different link. So yeah, hopefully they will be pretty nice. Uh, both of these games are in 2015. Uh, 2015, 2016 uh, was when I got my norms and uh, these were pretty intense tournaments for me and uh, it was pretty nice that I was beating higher rated so hopefully uh, how I prepared to get to that and how I prepared the game might help you prepare in, uh, for your own preparations in the tournaments so let's get started this game was against uh, Jean Saya. She is uh, pretty strong, uh, and she was a better chess player uh, at this game. She still is, and um, this is uh, in World Junior 2015. She was she had like seven out of seven in that tournament, and the tournament is 13 round long. And I believe I was playing against her around 11. She ended up winning the tournament, but. Not this game. <laughs> All right, let's get into it. So she's a pr uh, she her uh, uh, sorry in in this specific tournament she loved playing uh, Rui Lopez and I do believe that she is a very um, she loves playing Rui Lopez in general. Uh, something might have changed, but the, Rui Lopez is one of those super classic chess that uh, everybody plays uh, in higher higher levels so after bishop b5 yeah so there are many many moves that black can do the the usual ones are berlin with knight f6 or a6 that follows later with knight f6 um, some unusual ones are the d6 and g6 and um, they are very playable they are, they have been played in super grandmaster level chess and um, so for this specific game, I prepared against her the move f5, which is called um, Janish. It has a, another name too, but I learned it as Janish. And um, I mainly did this because I saw that she had bad results against this, and she didn't. It didn't feel like she knew it uh, in depth as much as I did. I had prepared this beforehand, before the tournament, but I wasn't really pl planning on playing it. So I played it specifically against this opponent. So that's something that you can try. If you play with someone enough or you have the time to prepare against them, you can try to find out what weaknesses do they have and go after them, spe especially in opening. D3 is one of the main lines. The other lines that could be considered is knight c3. Uh, there's taking, there's bishop c6, but the two main lines are d3 and knight c3. So she went f for d3. After uh, the pawns exchanged, um, you can immediately feel that well, bla black's hopefully gonna try to do short castle. Black would want to have this bishop in this diagonal because uh, the bishop in this dia diagonal would be very strong attacking f2 and it's such an open diagonal. Um, you know that this knight's definitely gonna wanna be on f6. So that's something that you already have a very clear plan. So after knight f6, castle, bishop c5. Yeah, so you, you have a clear idea. If you have one more move, you are going to try and do short castle as black and after the short castle you have a very a nice flow of ideas you want to play d6 you want to bring your bishop out you have so much more space and it just it's such a nice flow so after bishop d3 uh, after queen c5 i gave up the answer queen d3 is one of the main ideas that prevents making short castle because now if short castle there's the queen c4 and your bishop is hanging so um, is temporary mm, preventing black from making short castle. So another 
how, how do you think black can proceed? Should black keep fighting to try and play short castle with moves such as d6? Or do you see anything else? I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Still can't hear you. I am so sorry. Oh. Um, maybe. What do you think about a move like knight d4 for black? I really can't hear you. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Okay, why? He says don't move knight to d5. He thought you were saying knight d5 because the pawn would capture. Yeah, uh, n I'm talking about knight d4. So you would be attacking the bishop, and um, you're not directly trying to actively make short castle as um, white is trying to prevent it. Yeah, that's that's your idea. If knight d4, you are going to try and capture the b5 bishop because. Um, no, I think the knight should move to d4. I mean, okay. D4. All right, great. Yeah, um, there you could try and play something like d6, and maybe follow it with something like queen e7 and bishop e6, and try to make short castle. But um, at least at the time. Knight d4 was a stronger idea, um, both by by engines and by just human eye, because it's it's it keeps your game more active. If you play d6, you're playing passively because you need to spend another move trying to play queen e7, bishop e6, and you don't have that nice flow anymore. So knight d4 is the right move, and so if black. If it was black to move again, black would most likely try to take on b5. So that's why the knights would get exchanged here, ideally. Um, and so this bishop on d4 is pretty strong. White is kind of um, tied up. White can't really move this bishop to g5 per se because of the b2 pawn. Um, so knight, knight d2 doesn't really make much sense because I'm going to try and make castle now because the bishop is protected. And so the white tried to kick this bishop out. Uh, c3 and bishop c5 doesn't really serve any purpose for, for black because the bishop was on c5 a few moves ago and it, was on, it would be under attack after castle and queen c4 regardless. So after c3, bishop comes back to b6. It's generally also a good idea, especially for beginners, intermediates, players not to leave their pieces hanging like if he would play bishop c5 it gives you more chances to blunder and just you might forget about it so that's something that um, I also try not to do in my uh, rapid and blitz games I try not to leave my pieces hanging I always try to have them protected by something and it usually prevents um, blunders so after bishop b6 uh, I'm going to try and do short castle. So white has to keep fighting for me not to do short castle. Because if I do p play this short castle, I still have a pretty easy position and the rook on f8 and the bishop on b6 would be s looking at f2. So um, she went for bishop c4 to prevent my castling. And after that, I have this idea to try and still play d6. Maybe I'm, I'll try and play queen, c, queen e7 um, with idea bishop e6. Maybe to keep pushing for short castle. But um, I actually remember that I have looked at this position before the game, not specifically to prepare it, just because it was a question for myself that, well, what am I going to do in this position? And I do remember that in my before the game analysis, I reached a position that I didn't make short, didn't make any castle, and I kept my king on e8, 
and had a rook just to f8 to just um, develop the rook. So I I was mentally okay with not castling going into this position and going into this game. So I feel like that's something that if you didn't know that computer approves of you not castling, it might have been a little hard psychologically not to want to castle. So yeah, um, here she started pushing a little on the queen side, which was pretty smart because it takes away my any idea that I might have from making like long castle and also wants to play a5 and uh, grab my bishop. So um, I played a5. There is, there is this little difference between a5 and a6 that usually players don't pay enough attention to. Um, if you would go a6, most likely would would face something like this and it just gives way too much space to black to white and white has ideas to start attacking your queen side pretty immediately whereas when you play a5 even though it serves the same purpose that you're opening the a7 square for your bishop now it means that if something like b4 it might before might even be not such a good move you can take it you can bring you can like take it maybe and then do something like bishop d4 again attack the rook you have more ideas and your position is not so um, tangled anymore so in the game i played a5 she continued with bishop g5 yeah um and in at this point in my game i did realize that yeah, I'm not gonna be able to do castle anymore. I I was okay with that, but so knowing that you don't, you're not gonna do short castle. What's the move you would do in this position? Yeah. Rook Yeah, that's a, that's one of the moves that's coming up, but. Um, do you, how do you feel about the bishop on g5? Do you like it there? Do you want it to go away? <laughs> yeah. You're like questioning the validity. I have problem pronouncing this. <laughs> of this bishop. If you play h6, well, after you play h6, uh, the bishop going to h4 is not a real thing because bishop h4, you're just going to move forward with g5 and this bishop has to go to g3 and this just looks like a tall pawn to me doesn't really do much here so um, another thing to consider after such moves of um, h6 is after ta if if your opponent would take the knight your queen is way more useful here you wanted your queen to develop you you have this strong bishop here queen here you're gonna do rook f8 next move and you're going for this pawn so Another thing is when your opponent plays bishop g5, psychologically, <laughs> you kind of don't want it to be there. So you kind of want to, you want to know where does this bishop like want to go. And playing a move like h6 might give your opponent the chance to make the mistake. Be whereas if when you play rook f8, your opponent wouldn't be so inclined to move the bishop for a second time. So, h6. Um... So after having said that, where do you think your uh, white's bishop should go? Do you want to go all the way back to d2? What would you do with the white knight then? Okay, so you are thinking about bishop d2 and then you're gonna try and regroup your pieces with knight a3 and... That's it, yeah, it's... Um, there is nothing wrong with bishop d2 except the fact that keeps my strong bishop over here. So another way to think about it again just psychologically without having to calculate it is objectively my bishop on b6 is stronger than your bishop on g5 so try to exchange it off as white 
I would, I mean, as black, I would love to keep this bishop, but I can't anymore. So not, even if bishop d2 serves a higher purpose, um, bishop e3 is going to annoy me, really. Like, I don't want to exchange this bishop, and I have to now. So, yeah. Um, I do have to take on e3, because if I don't, then you're going to take my bishop, and then this pawn structure is really not what you want to play. So, bishop e3, queen takes e3. Now, even though the, the he, what, she managed to take off uh, my strong bishop off the board, created some other weaknesses. See, this is a weakness, that if the knight gets there, it's already unleashing so many attacks and squares and so many weaknesses, so many ideas. So the first thing that you should realize is this. So after every exchange, it's a good idea to think about, so what's different now? And the big thing that's different is I don't have that much pressure on f2 square, whereas I have access to this f4 square. So um, in this situation, what do you want to do? Do you think it's a good idea to start off with knight h5 and try to jump to f4? Or do you want to try and do something else to prepare for it better? Is there anything wrong with knight h5 actually? Yeah, I am talking. I'm talking about this maneuver just to, because um, the knight would be very much stronger there, and it would be attacking uh, least of all g2. So, I'm asking if it's a good idea to play knight h5 immediately, or do you want to try and prepare this idea more? Okay, so you want to do it straight forward. Yeah, uh, I don't, I don't think there is anything that's like wrong with knight h5. Uh, but for me, I wanted to prepare it more, and that's why I played with queen e7. Um, I was still considering something like bishop e6, and honestly, in the game, I was a little, I didn't really, um, I didn't want to deal with something, the idea of queen f3, even though I do have knight f4. Um, it still gives, uh, I feel like it gives unnecessary complications. I might have a different opinion if I was playing it right now, but I just wanted to have it more prepared. So I played queen e7, I, I still hold this bishop e6 idea and I'm protecting this f7 square from any possible um, knight h5 queen f3s. Yeah, that's an idea. I'm. I haven't. I, w I was still undecided on if I do want to play bishop e6 and maybe castle or not, short castle, because I still do have the option of short castle. It's not illegal yet. <laughs> so um, she played queen d3. I didn't really understand this move, honestly. I think uh, she thought I was going for bishop e6, so, so she just wanted to have this bishop protected. Mm -hmm. But now with queen d3, knight h5 makes much, much more sense because knight f4 would gain a tempi. So after knight h5, she played g3, which I do think it was the best, best way to go because after g3 is protecting this square and even though it's opening up some other weaknesses for the bishop, for example, um, it's choosing between one weakness or the other like the only way to stop my knight jumping to f4 is to play this g3 so after g3 i feel like bishop h3 is pretty automatic so you just glance at it and you do bishop h3 rook e1 uh, rook d1 i don't really think there's much of a difference between rook e1 or d1 so after rook e1 i wanted to um, try and attack a bit more so when after this bishop h3, um, 
I know for a fact I'm not gonna bring this bishop back to e6 to try to short castle, so I might as well just play rook f8. And after rook f8, I am already pressuring f2. I might want to play queen f6, I might want to try and mm, push for f3 square. I have different ideas, and this rook belongs to f8. I might not be sure where should I put the queen, but the rook I know it should be on f8. Um, she continued developing, which is very reasonable. And here I had the idea to try and play uh, g5, and my idea was to have this queen in this file and then trick with something like knight f4. So the idea is, uh, for example, b4, queen f6. I attack your pawn first, you defend it with queen, which because, I mean, rook e2 shouldn't really be working, least of all bishop g4. Also, the knight f4 would be stronger. Um, queen e3, now queen g6. I want to play knight f4. And if I get the chance to play knight f4, if you take it with the pawn, I take with my g pawn. I'm attacking your queen, I'm giving you check. Yeah, it's not pretty. So after queen g6, um, I feel like bishop f1 might have worked as well because now knight f4, you just continue something like this. And um, I, I like black's position. I still keep pressure and even though the bishops are exchanged off, um, my knight is pretty strong here and you can't really take it off right now. So another way to go instead of bishop f1 was to simply play king h1. Not every move is supposed to be crazy ideas. King h1 just blocks this idea of knight f4, g f4, g f4 check. So after king h1, I pretty much realized that knight f4 is kind of a dream that might not come true anymore. So I decided to relocate the pieces, especially because I can't improve this queen over here. This queen belongs closer to the king. So I was trying to like dug up, dig up some some pathway for my queen. Uh, I can actually. What do you think I should do? I've already said that I want to put my queen closer to white's king, and I've already said that the knight on h5 isn't really serving much purpose anymore. Yeah? Uh, bring the knight to f6 and put mm -hmm. the queen on the h file? Yeah, that's pretty much the idea. Maybe not necessarily... Um, I mean, knight f6 also follows with the idea of knight g4. So then the main thing to think about after knight f6 is that um, your opponent has to quickly uh, stop knight g4 with most likely something like f3, which is actually what happened in the game. And then, yes, you put the, um, well, I gave up the, the move, but I feel like that's something that was going to happen regardless because your queen isn't, it's not enough to just be in h5, you want it to be on h3. So, and the bishop here isn't really doing anything as much anymore. It's keeping the tabs on g2 and f1 squares, but it can always come back. So, something like bishop d7, I'm not actually going to take a takes b4 and rook takes a4, because it would just open up more uh, ideas and space for white in the queen side. But um, it's at least giving the scares and now white has to think about okay now i have to try and um, calculate about does this work does that work so i feel like bishop d7 was a pretty nice move just at least psychologically um so she approached it with bishop b5 and after bishop b5 um i think queen h5 was the right move I could consider something like c6, but I really didn't want to do c6 unless I absolutely have to, because d6 opens up some squares for maybe queen b6 and gives ideas about d6 square. So I wanted to try and keep this center to the queen side as solid as possible. So queen h5. Um, I do think that bishop d7 was uh, slightly smarter than rook f1. But 
it still opens up um, like I still have the idea to double up the rooks and still continue with an attack but I feel like this would have been stronger for white just to try to create more chances but uh, after rook f1 queen h3 pretty immediately king g1 knight h5 this should also be pretty automatically because your knight doesn't really have anywhere good to go except for h5 and after h5 might want to do some knight f4 might want to take this guy and um i mean ideally yeah i think if it was black to move again knight takes g3 let's say white did something weird like taking over here i think knight g3 should be working and then rook comes to f4 this, this should be winning enough so um that's the even though they're, they're like little tricks that most likely your opponents wouldn't fall for because they're very straightforward it's also improving your position like queen on h3 is serving a nice purpose knight on h5 is serving a good purpose also it's opening up with some ideas and trying to double the rooks up so she played queen e2 which i do think was the best move or at least one of the best moves the had, had a very nice idea protecting the king at least well um at this point i realized that well there could also be some bishop d7 if i take with king could be some queen b5s and i didn't really want to yep oh <laughs> sorry i didn't really want to um deal with the the hassles of giving my opponent too many chances so i just played c6 bishop c4 bishop d3 i don't really think there's much difference between bishop c4 or bishop d3 now um probably i could have tried to play rook f6 and king e7 and rook uh, rook a f8 and attacking over here but again i didn't really want to deal with something like taking over here and some rook to b1 and attacking i just didn't really maybe not maybe saying i didn't want to deal with isn't the best phrase but i didn't want to give my opponent that chance to uh, to be able to attack me so i would have to deal with it <laughs> um so yeah that's why i took on b4 and now king e7 i'm following up with the idea that i want to double up my rooks on the f file and um, she's also trying to create some counter plays over here um now we're, this is kind of a critical moment because in the game she played rook f2 but according to computers rook a2 is better and can you tell me why it's okay if you can't but so in the game she moved this rook up but computer says this is better why do you think It's okay, as soon as I show the next few moves, um, it will give you a clear idea why. But it's okay, just keep, in, keep it in mind, what do you think is the difference between rook f2 and rook a2? So just keep that question in mind as we go in about two train moves, it should uh, clear up. So uh, regardless of what, let's go, let's go along with the, what she played in the game. She played rook f2. What do you think black should do? Yep. That is a very smart idea and that's something that's coming up. That's something that um, both white and black are thinking about. But you can prepare it a little bit more. Because if knight takes g3, white would just take back the knight and queen g3, rook g2 and um it's it's uh, still pretty nice but you can prepare it better how do you think you can prepare it better I 
Um, I, I would. I think it's better if you stick with an I G3 idea. Just prepare it. Knight takes G3 better. Um, so the idea, the idea of knight g3 is very valid, but in order to prepare it better, something like g4. Ah, oh, when you think about something, just say it. So now white can't really take back on g4 because of bishop g4, least of all, brings my bishop back to the attack. Um, so something like f4, and what now? Um, you could do that, but the problem is that it gives it creates more chances of such as e5, and it gives white the chance to start attacking me. And usually, these little things that um, you think you're already winning, but you give your opponents slight chance to start attacking you, and things start going sideways. So I I've been trying to train myself not to do that. So EF4 is one of those moves, unless it's absolutely winning and you can calculate every little detail, you shouldn't do it because it gives the, your opponent the chance to start opening it up. Um, you said this move before. What do you think we should do? G3. Yeah, now is the time. G4 was the preparation that we needed because now, after Rook G2, now, what do you think you should do as black? This move is the difference between the having the rook to a2 or to a1. Oh no, <laughs> that that is uh, yeah that's right. That's wouldn't really be a sacrifice. It would be a blunder. <laughs> You're right. That's not a good move. Think about it a little more. Like so, this guy is here all alone with no protection. What do you want to do to it? And attack it. Uh, yeah. Now with queen to c3, this is like an intermediate move because ideally. Now let's look at this position. Uh, so if your opponent plays rook a, if uh, my opponent plays rook a2, g4, f4, take, take, take. For example, queen g2. Uh, I, this queen uh, c3 doesn't work anymore. Even though I still have this, and uh, it should still be pretty pleasant for black to continue. I don't have this queen c3. Yeah, I came to d2 and stayed here. That's true. But yeah, so you see, the difference here is that the queen on g2 and the rook on a2 with uh, here having to get to play queen c3. Because after queen c3, now I can actually try and take this with the rook. Because then again, if rook e1 or rook d1 or anywhere, I can't really take back with the pawn, even though it looks so amazing, you're going where f3, g3, there's again this e5 ideas coming up. So... But it, it, if you think we're pawn though, and you, you try to capture, you try to capture the rook, you can capture his queen. It's double check. So you're talking about e5, f3, double check. Oh. Yeah. See, that's what I'm saying, don't give your opponent chances. You give chances, little mistakes happen. So you take back with the rook. Solid, strong, you still have advantage. Even though it's slight, you have advantage. And see, your queen is taking all these pawns over here. And that's actually what happened in the game. I took pretty much all the pawns. And now I go for exchange of queens. Why? 
when you have more material it's a good idea to think about exchanging off the heavy pieces uh, it helps out the end game there are exceptions and sometimes you just have a good attack and you can win but in this specific situation just imagine if my opponent did take this guy I have f five pawns to one knight and one pawn this should be more than enough to win I'm gonna start pushing these pawns and this rook is pretty misplaced um, so yeah she she's, uh, was pretty smart and didn't really take it she went with queen g3 now I try to double up my rook also in this uh, specific situation we were all both in super time trouble like playing on seconds from what I remember and um, I do believe that I something about a king going to h1 or the check first and then king h1 because uh, I remember that after the game I was like oh she had that and the reason is that if it was black to move again I want to play rook f2 I want to exchange off these pieces and I want to enter the end game which is I know I'm gonna safely win whereas here you might have some little tactics coming up even though I'm, I don't really see them right now but yeah Well, that's good. You're seeing the little tactics. Good job. Queen time, queen. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it, she could have uh, thought about something like king h1, so that rook f2 wouldn't really mean as much, because now maybe even can take this since um, this guy's pinned, and it would create more crazy chances. But in the game, she played bishop e2 to attack the g4 pawn, and um, here I believe we repeated. Uh, well, sorry, I thought we repeated. I king d8. I was simply just going for king c8, and I wanted to kick the rook out. And then after bishop a6, I'm not gonna play king c8 anymore. And also king d8. The other idea is that you're, I'm simply um, getting rid of the pin that was on my bishop. Because here, there could be some ideas with bishop takes g4, but when I move the king, bishop g4 doesn't work anymore because of that my bishop is also protecting it. So uh, she played bishop a6. I think she, I don't really know what she was, uh, what was her idea. But another thing is, for example, here, um, I could think about a move like, such as queen d2, but I believe it wouldn't have worked because of um, bishop g4. And then you could think about a move like rook f2, and then there is this rook d7. And you see, it's already getting complicated um, unnecessarily. So, yeah. That's why um, a simple move such as king d8 uh, is enough to win. Um, yeah. So here she played bishop a6, rook f2. I'm going for the exchange. And now again, I took the one last pawn that was remaining. I gave few checks, and now I'm going for queen f3, rook b2. I think I there were other ideas that I could have tried, but this seemed to be simple enough for a win. And see here, I could think about something like probably bishop e6 with the idea of bishop d5. I think that's actually pretty good. But I didn't want to leave this rook hanging, so I just I wanted to have it protected, so it would avoid any kind of blunders. Rook f2, and I think rook f2 was um, kind of a bad move, because after rook f2 you just exchange it off, and this end game is winning. But anyways, th this th this situation black is winning anyways. It's just a matter of how. And here was actually pretty fun for me. See you're pushing your pawns, still trying not to blunder, keeping the pawns strong. And like, it's okay if you give out this pawn, but it's kind of a good idea to keep the rest of them. So like if here she took, it doesn't really like work. Just, I will bring the king and I'll keep pushing and the king has to stay here, where, whereas the bishop can't really stop these pawns. And also, well, yeah, so a little bit longer and 
almost resignation. Yeah, this was actually pretty cool. I loved how my position <laughs> looked. This was, um, even though she wasn't the highest rated that I've beaten, mm, it was one of my most favorite games because it just felt like such a clean win. I had some tactics, I had some strategy, and it just, it felt really good. <laughs> also the fact that she won the championship. Um, yeah. So this was the first game I wanted to show you. Uh, let's move on to the next one, uh, unless someone has a question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, could you tell uh, when she was out of her opening prep and how early did that happen? Uh, the, uh, yeah. The F5 um, early in the opening, I, f I do remember that she, she definitely didn't expect F5, but I do remember that um, Queen d3, knight d4, I feel like this was about time when she was out of prep. I think uh, probably she expected something like d6 because it's the safer way to go and it used to be more common back in the days, <laughs> 2015. <laughs> and I feel like around here was when she was out of prep after a5, yeah. Because I don't think bishop g5 is actually a good move because even if even if you play bishop e3 first should be like better because I have to take and at least I mean if my pawn is on h6 it helps me I want to play g5 I want to push but now I am um, it was just a feeling I had in the game that she was out of prep when she played bishop g5 but she definitely knew queen d3 and um, yeah and knight d4 is not so hard to decide between taking and c3 is also pretty natural so yeah anything else Cool. Ah. So, this game, I was white, and again, 2015, but December. Um, this was in Cathars Masters. Um, I do believe that I was the lowest ranked there, or like one of the last, one of the lowest ranks. And rated strengths. Yeah? Oh. No. Um, so, yeah. We are gonna do um, at least until the some part of this game, and we're just gonna like push through to the next one. Uh, because this is pretty interesting and it's, um, it, ha it did have a pretty interesting end game as well. So, French. I know Tracy, you hate French. <laughs> she hates it. I don't know why. It's so nice. Uh, so, um, I feel like this knight c3 is not like a lot of people play knight d2, but um, for me, I uh, I looked. F I used to be very weak in French, and I um, read the book that Primer John Negi did about e4 versus like French, Karokan, Philidor, a bunch of stuff, and I liked it and I followed it. Became my chess bible for a few few months. It was a pretty good book. And um, so yeah, I used to be very afraid of this, this uh, Vinover. I do believe it's called Vinover. Yeah, I might be saying it wrong, but yeah. So um, there are many different lines that black can go for. Black could try to do the c5 short castle, or I mean, you kind of have to do c5. There are some like king f8s and stuff that I'm not the biggest fan of it it's a little confusing but um well not after that book <laughs> so after c5 queen g4 is i mean it it's something that works against both mm, short castle and uh, if queen c7 and so um i'm not gonna get in, in too detailed in the theory of this i'm hoping that i could dedicate a full month maybe a little more to go into French opening as white 
in these series. Um, but yeah, so this could be a preview. <laughs> yeah, so Queen C7. Um, there are many different lines. One of them, I do believe that the, the main main line is like taking G7, Rook G8. Oops. Um, and then like you just start taking everything and um, that's a little crazy. I, I've played it. I don't remember it move by move. I do know that what I generally should be looking out for, um, but um, that wasn't on that book. <laughs> so, uh, 2015, I was um, uh, I I believed in the book. I went by the book. Yeah. Um, so, Bishop D3 is actually what was in the book, and the idea is that. Um, everybody kind of knows the little itty bitty details of taking and taking and they've been playing it for years and there's so much theory in it and um, it's one way to run out of theory to run away from theory and make your opponent to run out of theory because Bishop D3 is kind of um, again annoying <laughs> you're not going by what your opponent always plays because like even a friendly game black plays this a lot of people, more than 50%, I want to say more than 70%, would take on a g7, take on a7, and it's just automatic. So, bishop d3, just not, not letting your opponent have that free breath. Um, taking on d4, there, I, I do believe there's a c4 here. And there, the uh, wait, nope, c4 is blunder. Uh, you can just take on, wait, can you? Sorry, I'm mixing up my games. C4 is a move because uh, if you take on G7, Rook G8, if you take on H7, I mean, you're kind of giving up the piece. But C4 is a move and um, I do believe that I have some games like that too. Anyways, so the idea is after CD4, now you can get to play Knight E2 because if you take, there is the Queen C3 check so you are not free of that so knight e2 is that the idea is you protect your c3 square and um, if they take like this now you can simply just take back and if queen f6 bishop g5 it's a pretty neat trick huh yeah it's goodbye party for the queen so um, it has these little tricks that you should uh, black should watch out for um, so D takes c3, queen takes g7, rook comes, take the other pawn, take this pawn. Now, the idea with h4 is um, you could try to play something like bishop f4 first, and if queen f6 now something like h4, but I do believe that's the wrong way to go. Um, there are some rook g2s, I think. Yeah, now you don't have bishop f5, bishop g5 because of, well, f2 square and I do believe that in another game earlier um, I kind of mixed up my opening oops um, and then I learned from it so h4 now the idea is when you do something else such as knight d7 oh sorry keeps coming um, after knight d7 bishop f4 now you get to do bishop g5 the idea is if uh, well, black plays something like queen e5, you sh this should be should be good, right? Also something like maybe f4 first. Now you gotta move the queen. If you don't go to h8, you move it away. Again, you can, and the rook is defenseless. So yeah, it has all these little tricks. So after bishop g5, I do believe that the best move is queen h8 and queens exchanged i i mean it's not technically an end game yet just because the queens are off but um you can see how this flow of moves coming this pawn is already like a baby queen this is something that you know you're gonna keep pushing you do know that as white you're gonna go long castle you do want to take this pawn you do want to push these pawns as much as possible. So these are your just basic ideas. And 
how do you think what, uh, what should proceed now? Should like with what move should you continue? Why do you move? What do you do? Why not? It's up to you. You could take it first, you could long castle first, you could push h5 first. Long, right? I think so. Yeah, sure. Why not? I mean, it's coming up. It's just a matter of deciding if you want to do it first or you want to take c3 first. Um, so, I did take it on c3 first, and I do have the idea to go here, at least try to go to b5, and um, so a6 to take away that idea, long castle, f6, you see, um, if it's white to move again, I'm gonna start pushing for g4, h5, so it is a good idea to try and push the bishop out because if you try something like knight e5 there could be this bishop f6 even if you take this to check um bishop the rook is under attack you gotta move it now g4 could be coming up or simply um you don't well as black you don't really know how to untangle your pieces or what do you want to do with this bishop so that's probably why f6 was played. Knight e5 attacking this bishop. I really wanted to keep my bishop. So mm. also the other thing is after bishop e2, this f4 and then h5, g4, it, it's all kind of flowing. So um, yeah, bishop e2, another knight to f5, still attacking all my bishops. And at this point, I realized that I can't keep running away with the bishops. Uh, I mean, I take theoretically I could, and then they, they it could keep chasing. Or um, it wasn't the right flow. That um, yeah. So I continued with h5. I do think. I mean, I think sh he should have taken it. I would have taken this bishop if I was black, just because um, least of all it's creating annoying, um, now how would I push, now I, I can't really push on g5, and it would uh, disturb this flow of moves that I had, so I do think knight e3 should have been played, but bishop d7, uh, alright. Is it about time to move this to the next one? I'm gonna call it. Oh, into the. Well, uh, if you change the stream, you mean? Yeah, it is Let, end game. Let's just finish this one because it uh, would be weird to switch over in the middle. Okay, it is end game. I'm just saying. That's fine. I can change the title later. Sure. Uh, all right. So, how do you think you should proceed here? You want to start pushing the pawns? What? Yeah, I agree. I think it's about time. You could try to protect this guy a little bit more, but... Okay, yeah, it, it makes sense, right? You want to play bishop before and then you want to push the pawn after. You see, it's different a little bit because now these pawns are actually two passed pawns rather than if uh, the bishop was exchanged over here, then the, it wouldn't have been two passed pawns. It wouldn't have been as easy to do. But at the same time, now black has a, can start doing stuff in the center. So I, I mean, 
my knight is under attack, so I play rook h3 to defend it, and at the same time I want to play g4, I want to bring this rook. Uh, I do believe that um, something like king f7 was a slightly more accurate, just because how it unfolded in the game. But um, the idea is that black has to do something in the center and queen side, because if black doesn't, then um, if black is just sitting, I do believe the right term is sitting duck. Right? Yeah. I'm just gonna push these pawns and keep pushing and um, well, it's very nice for me, very annoying for him. Might come up with something, but yeah, very unlikely. So black should be trying to do stuff in the queen side and center. That's why I knight d6. Now, I didn't really, um, I felt quite unsafe to allow something like d4. Uh, especially since so here if d4 now I have knight come to e4 so if oops, d4 I could do something like knight e4 so I feel like the fact that um, knight d6 was actually pretty smart now d4 is a real threat and I knew that d4 was coming up regardless of what I do so I wanted to relocate the knight faster to maybe try and do knight e4 so if d4 knight g4 that was the initial idea d4 takes away that idea but also creates a weakness in e4 square f3 and now knight c4 trying to go for e3 and i do believe that this was getting a little dangerous for me so that's why i eliminated the knight you see, even though like this bishop would be such a monster, let's say for example in e4, protecting so many squares and trying to go for g4, g5, um, it's not worth it. This, I mean, it's not worth it to let this knight to be that strong. So, I decided to exchange it off, just protecting c2. Um, I think this was the the smarter choice to go, even though it would give me. Uh, like this pass pawn, I think this was uh, this was the the way to fight it. Now you see earlier when I mentioned king to f7 instead of king e7, I don't know if I remember the position, but if the king was already on f7, black was like a tempi up, wouldn't have to waste that tempi trying to bring the king because it was kind of obvious the king eventually would have to come and protect stuff over here. So, pretty obvious, g4, rook g2, these are all like obvious moves, still pretty obvious. I do think h6 would have worked, but I really, really wanted this knight to not just die here. So, knight f2. Uh, I might want to go to g4, might want to go to even e4, might want to go to d3. So. I block the rook and attack. You see like a, a little move like knight f2 might not be your first choice, but all of your pieces are doing something. Your Both of your rooks are in the best position. Your pawns are ready to be pushed. It's more like just a, a, a notch. I think that's how you say it. Or in g4 to attack e5. So yeah, knight f2, now knight d3. Also, this pawn is um, defenseless. So, yeah. Yeah, that's the idea. I'm f it's opponent's move, but that is the idea. Good job. So yeah, I mean, if you do something like whoops, king f5, shouldn't be working because I mean, two baby queens. So, uh, my opponent decided to kind of. Um, give up the exchange yeah and now you see this still needs some some technique to win it it is winning position but you need to know how to follow up with it um, you can't just do something like I mean technically you could but you would be leaving your pawns um, defenseless so it is a good idea to just take it slow play rook g3 defend your g5 pawn now you want to do h7 so black has to go I thought black has to go back, but now 
you attack the bishop. Um, it's just like trying out different things, but the idea is that you need your rook to be in eight rank, that so you can start giving checks and start pushing for queens. Now you want to do rook f6, and then you want to follow it with maybe rook h3 and then g6. Okay, um, probably this this should also be losing because of g7 and g8 is unstoppable. But king h5 just made it a little easier. Yep, and he gave up around now. So yeah, this was actually pretty interesting. Um, I wish we could go a little bit more into detail about the end game, <laughs> but. Um, it was pretty straightforward, right? You knew what you were doing, and you just kept on pushing for it. Yeah, um, that's all I had for today's chess and psychology. I hope you learned um, some new tricks, and yeah, let's do more end games. Yeah.